sorting him in. They open it up to um, the vacancies for uh, one vacancy tonight. Um, so do I hear any nom nominations from the board? So, so accordingly, Noah, 
the neighborhood board commission has taken a position that if a, if a neighborhood community member has missed eight meetings in a year, they still will not be replaced until that eighth meeting, they still said, you know what, I haven't responded to you, so I'm still not going to be replaced. We're going to go on number nine. Thank you, Neighborhood Commission. Okay, that's correct. Number we'll, nine. We'll have the Maybe. commission, we we'll have the commission call you yeah. from yeah. to clarify that. That's right. The rules are the third meeting of, of an absence in an annual year, you can be replaced. That's in the Neighborhood Commission. But there's also a procedure of the commission. There is, there's also um, a procedure that the commission had um, set aside their top top so like I said for me yeah replace them that's fine that's not that's not what I'm saying what the commission is telling us chair could could we just uh listen to the uh, all of the legal commission here to satisfy Mr. Burr here well and, and one question too about my Mr. Chair I don't know if this is official or not but I thought I had gotten email correspondences from the Neighborhood Commission, uh, you know, Mick, uh, and, and these emails, he clearly explained, and was sent to all board members, that after three absences, it's the prerogative of the chair and the relations. So I don't, I, I might just be misreading that, and I'm confused, and so that was a clarification that I, as an average person reading an average email from someone with authority, uh, is communicated, which is after three absences. So it does seem absurd that you can eight or nine, it just, it just I, don't, I don't understand why. Like I said, we can do that if you guys want to do that, but right now what I'm getting from Lola is they'll, they'll notify you in Tom Scott. Mr. Chair, may I be recognized, please? Yes, go ahead. Um, Nola. Was a letter you said sent out after the third meeting? It was just sent out. Yes. It was just sent out. After eight meetings. After eight meetings. Then. The board. The, it, it was. It was a chair's. Is it the chair's responsibility? Was the board can send their own letter, or they authorize our office to send a letter, which they did last month. So I sent a certified letter to Clay. And we till today that we have not received the response, the 30 days, so he can his vacancy needs to be put on the next month agenda. Okay, it was just sent out after last month's meeting. After last month, it's not within the 30 days yet. The response is not is yeah, still but it's, Jerry Reed tonight you can declare his seat vacant and we'll put it on next month's agenda. So how come it's on tonight's agenda? It's on tonight's agenda. Okay. To vacate his seat, yes. It's on the agenda to vote to vacate his seat for the next month's meeting. That's what it is. Because he did not respond to the certified letter. Now we can take a VC, but it's not open to next month's meeting. Well, Mr. Chair, um, I'd like yes, to sir. clarify that, that we don't have to vote on that. It's your priority to just say that it is fake. Well, I also did that last month, and then I was corrected. It has to be known. Well, well, because the letter was not sent out, so, so then when you made it fake, you, know, you just said that it was missed. We have to be noticed in case there's other people in the community who like to fill the vacancy, not just those here in the audience tonight. Okay. Not that you'll be in violation. Well, can I, I'd be interested in, in learning who, who's vacancy uh, Sheriff of Ellensville, because I don't recall there being the same process and notification and announcement to the public when we, as a board, elected one night to put the chair of the fellow on the board. So I just, I, I, again, I don't understand. I'm, I'm, sure sure it's my, I'm sure it's my mistake and my misunderstanding, but maybe we can help me to attain some clarity as someone who's trying to represent the average person. Okay, okay. Um, the point of order, uh, let me clarify something um, here. The seat that I had filled was an open seat and it was a resident resigned seat. So they did not have to have a resignation letter sent from the board. They resigned their position. In writing, the certified letter? Yes. Email. Email. Oh, email. 
Oh. You want a coffee? They'll send you one. Okay. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, I'm going to close the nominations. Anybody else who may want to nominate? That's it. I'd like to nominate Tuli. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Close. Uh, but I don't wish you to close. Um, he doesn't want to volunteer and stuff, so do I have a nomination to close? You want a second to close? Can I have a motion to close, Chair? Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. So, right now we only have one nomination for fill the vacancy. Um, do we do a roll call? Uh, this is for Andrew Prudy. shelter. 
Now that doesn't prohibit, uh, say, the Lions or a community organization to donate a shelter, but at this point, because of the limited number of shelters we do have, we are not able to install the shelter unless there's a, it meets the minimum criteria of 30, pa of 30 passenger count. And I'd like to also announce that the city is, uh, has applications available for summer youth employment. Um, this, this application has been extended through April 20th, and this would be for young adults ages 14 through 24 for a six month period summer employment starting June 15th through July 24th. And applications are available online at uh, www.honolulu.gov slash DCS, which stands for the Department of Community Services. Um, you can navigate your way through to special projects where the applications are available. That's it, if you have any more questions. Money from the board. Terry. 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 Mr. Chair, before I address my uh, concern to uh, Ms. Olivera, um, last month it was said that the uh, people from who made the presentation regarding Mahiko Park, it said that they will be back here um, this month. It will be on the April agenda. Uh, I don't see that on the April agenda, Mr. Chair, and now my concern to Ms. Olivera is that since it's not on the agenda, could you take this back to whomever or to the mayor or to the TPP people that with $10 million, with the amount of money they're spending, why isn't there a record ball court inside or outside uh, for Mahiko Park? As my recollection during their presentation last month when they were here, they did talk about um, updating the master plan for every Mahiko. Um, but they also talked about the monies that are in the budget uh, for the improvements to the play court area. Their presentation was based on um, CIP monies that are available for um, these improvements to our play courts. So if your question is, what's the status of racquetball courts, I'll have to take that back. I don't believe that was raised last month. Well, the status is not, what's the status of it? It's not even considered or included. The racquetball is not in the last month. Yeah, it's not. According to the minutes of last month, mm -hmm. it's not included. Okay. Could you, um, so your question you would like me to ask the department is what specifically? Uh, why is it a racquetball court, indoor or outdoor, mm -hmm. included in the, uh, in the vision or in the plan? that was presented last month. Okay. I will submit that. Any other questions? was about uh, the one by Hanakahi Street, mm -hmm. the bus stop, if there ever going to be a bus shelter there. Um, I understand last week you were saying that yes, yes you do need at least 30 passengers or more. Mm -hmm. um, I did double check there is more than 30 passengers and I do want to know who is the person that is charting down how many people per bus stop and when do they go there? Well, the report I have is the boarding counts are conducted by the walking transit service. Um, there isn't a specific person or times that the counts are taken. Um, what I do have here is that, again, like I said earlier, the, they, did, they did survey um, that area. The highest was 23 boardings per day, but it would be... I suppose helpful to know what times of day. 
So I can get back to you on when these counts were taken. Because I can almost guarantee you if they go early morning, which I know nobody would want to come into Ever Beach or get out of Ever Beach, but um, it would be more than 30. Okay, so you suggested time frame to... I would suggest time frame when there's a lot of the express bus passes through and, and there's a lot more than 30 people standing there. Okay. And that's per day. Yes. I would recommend about between 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there, there is a lot of elderly, also elderly people catching the bus at that time also, and with all the shelter, the, yeah, and you know, with all the weather, wind, you know, and they, they don't have a uh, bench to sit on, and it, it, it just... Okay, we'll try again. Thank you. Um, I do have some other questions on Puppy Free Road. Um, this is trees on Puppy Free Road, and there's little, there's not little, but there's nuts about a golf ball size. Um, has, well, there was an incident that a kid was walking, and I guess he weren't watching where he was walking, and he kind of slipped over that nut. And it's like a golf ball size. So if that and was right in front of our home, so if that child was to get hurt, who would be responsible? Is that a city or is that a private like Hussey Well, if it's on the city roadway. It's on the sidewalk. It's on the sidewalk. The responsibility let me think about that. The responsibility of homeowners would be to maintain the planter area. Sidewalk. Um, if, you know, there's an uplift of the sidewalk, the city is responsible for maintaining that. Now, um, if it's a slip and fall because just something's there, um, and it's just a green, I'm not certain. I'm not Maybe our attorney can help us. <laughs> but I, I'm not certain. I, I would think that um, the city would be responsible, I mean, because something like that would be, I mean, there's some responsibility on the part of the um, pedestrian or the person walking by. I'm not certain what how it is. Yeah, because the, the way I look at it, those trees, the nuts are really big. Okay. But if those are little kids, I mean they could be walking that you know on that sidewalk and I mean that, that little boy bumped his head and I could hear it from my door. And he was across the street where that guy was up on the hill doing the hill. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, you know, I just want to know who is responsible and who is responsible of pulling that tree or, or you know, or um, gave the permission to put that tree there. Well, that, is, that type of tree, I mean. I think the best thing I can suggest is that a family submit a claim to the city to determine uh, responsibility at this point, unless the specific factual information is before anyone can a determination be made at this point that answer would be. So if you know that family you might want to encourage them to submit a claim to the city and then determine from there. Yeah, so I don't know the boy's name but he was so embarrassed he stood up and ran, you know. So I really don't know his name, but I just want to know just in case in the future who is responsible. There's a lot of factors that come into play. Yeah. It's difficult to say that. No. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, block up on the road. Do you have any idea of when they're going to start resurfacing that road after it was repaired about, you know, the abduction and everything about five years ago? I know we keep bringing this issue up. I know it has been something that's been raised before. I you know they. Until um, monies are available for actual construction, um, it's kept on the list um, and it's prioritized accordingly as funds become available. Okay, I believe it was back in 2006 or 2007, there was a $100,000 study on Pukiki Road to do the Maikai side, you know, for sidewalks and uh, drainage and so on. Um, do you know what happened to them? I don't know that particular survey. A, uh, a, did you say study or survey? There was a study, I'm sorry. They get they granted a hundred thousand dollars. I mean I was looking through all of my staff records and it says it was a hundred thousand dollars to have a survey done on that puppy road. Um, 
But I'm gonna keep trying, because again, I, I just have a big problem with the way it's worded right now. Again, not, obviously, we need to find the solution to this issue, but we can't over-legislate and create, I think, bigger problems by trying to solve the problem. I'll leave it at that, because I know you guys got a lot to take questions. Thank you. Call. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, three quick items. And first on your uh, page, uh, second, uh, third page, your report, uh, it says Westlock Golf Course Ponds and Waterways. That looks like over a million dollars for Westlock. That's Westlock. Uh, was that golf course ever being entertained to be sold by this administration? I don't know for sure, as, as my understanding right now is whether it was at all in the past, it was not something being looked to be sold at this point. I just want to, I'm, I'm not a know it all, but when I look at this, I, I'm thinking back that there was a point of time within the last couple of years that I believe the mayor's administration was looking at selling some of the municipal golf courses, we have a village's municipal golf course in the West Block. If a, if a million, 300,000 is going to go into that golf course and then get sold to a private entity, um, it says ponds and waterways. What's wrong with the current golf course that we need a million three for ponds and waterways on West Lock? There's there's major drainage problems on that course, and it's causing flooding into. So they closed nine holes. Yeah, they've been playing only nine holes for for over a month. But, but see, but that whole drainage system that was supposed to run through the golf course, that, as many of you know, here golf courses out here are built for drainage and flood patterns. Um, that West Lock is one that was for major drainage. That major canal that goes through there has not been cleaned out in years. And so that was to try to have money to start that process. It also is for that water is basically brought, some of that water at least that's in the ponds is our white water coming from the wastewater treatment plant, which is used for the irrigation of the golf course as well as for West Lock estates and villages. And there's problems with that, and that whole system needs to be fixed up. And so that's, I think, where a lot of that Council Member, that is an excellent answer because the clarification of just West Lock Golf Course, I'm thinking this is for the golf course for play, ponds and waterways to make to make the ninth hole look better. Yeah, no, but it, it now we're talking about Honey Uli Uli Stream, right on, thank you. Um, the other issue that came up last month is the, the, the city's representative talked about Eva Mahiko Park and the Long time standing since uh, Councilman DeSoto, Councilman Gabbard, now yourself, has been to bring a swimming pool to Eva Mexico Park. It's really been sought after for a long time that we as a community get a municipal swimming pool. And, uh, and it's not in your CIP. I know that it's a wish list and it's a tight budget, but but the other municipalities in good times got their swimming pool. So last month we didn't come to a, a note at all of what a swimming pool would cost. If possible, if you could provide for a wish list for that swimming pool at Evan Eagle Park, that would be my other comment. Finally, my third and final comment, Council Member, if you would please consider, is, is that I thought that the rail plan was going to bring like a park and ride. Uh, the rail plan first was an option to come down Geiger Road up Fort Weaver. And then we at Eva Beach, some 45,000 of us, would get a park and ride either at Renton Road and Fort Beaver Road, or actually a just hop on at Geiger and Fort Beaver. We lost that route. We lost the rail coming to the beach. So now it's going down Farrington. I thought there was going to be a parking ride at Fort Weaver, Farrington. So kind of like the southeast quadrant of that intersection was to be a parking ride for the 45,000 Eva Beach people that want to go into town. The last schematas that I've seen presented there is no more of a park and ride for the beach. We either got to go the opposite direction into Kapolei to get out of our cars, or we got to go into Pearl City to park our cars. In other words, am I missing something? Sort of, yes. Okay, and um, I'm going to slightly look at Joyce here because this is a map that I have been requesting from the department for over half of a year now, which is to have have a map that shows exactly where these parking rides are going to be along North South Road as well as up at the Farrington uh, Fort Weaver area. And then show the concentric circles of you know a quarter mile, a half mile to show people where it is because it's going to be easier for the majority of Eva to get to the very first station, which is going to be on North South Road at Copley Parkway, than it is for that portion of Eva to try to drive up Fort Weaver Road and get up to the Farrington Highway location. So there are going to be parking rides that are, I believe, very convenient for the EVA district to get to. 
And yes, I mean, there's going to be a slight travel westward, but again, because when that, those stations open, Copley Parkway will be completely open. It's going to be a pretty easy short shot for, for that traffic. The other, the other parking ride within that location is going to be at the top of North South Road at the UH West Oahu campus, uh, which is probably will more service than we would coach because they're going to be able to come down Farrington Highway to H1 and get off of H1 right at North South Road and jump into that parking ride. That one probably won't serve the other district as much. The, map, the, the, the discussion about whether the rail system should come down Fort Weaver Road, I know we've had that here in the past. Again, just to lay out for anyone new this listening, Part of that became balance between are, are we going to serve West Oahu campus or, or run it down Fort River Road? Because if it went down Fort River Road, we we're not going to reach UH West Oahu campus. And connecting the two campuses is a very key part of this overall rail system. Again, pros and cons both ways. Uh, but again, I believe that the parking rights, both at, at the very first station and at Ferrington Highway, is going to be a sufficient facility for EVA. But I. Yeah. Um, properties, is there any way um, for the community that's suffering there, um, is there any way we can get their lights turned on for the Makikula area? And it's one I don't know the answer to yet, but we got the message about the issue, so we'll take a look at it. I mean, part of the issue is, is the ownership side of it. Okay. And the, the message we've gotten back from, from the department that we came to is it is a private roadway. Um, and it's privately owned and maintained street lights. So it's not something that's under the siege jurisdiction, not something we can flip off. But obviously we can try to have at least some of the discussion with, with the private ownership, with the association, and try to help, try to facilitate them to figure it out. It's just not one of those. Is there any kind of, like, even though it's a private property and they have residents there, so is there any kind of zoning or, or kind of, because um, it's hazardous, it's dangerous for them to not have any lights. If stuff happens at night, they can't see anything. Trying, trying to put on my legal hat. I don't, the only thing I think you, that if it really rose to the point of being a nuisance, um, that there could be an action. But, but to force somebody to put lights on in the property, I mean, well, they, they have lights, they're just not paying for electricity. Right, and then I said, but yeah, trying to get them, trying to force someone, whether it's from the city or from a court standpoint, to force somebody to turn on their lights, um, I, you know, I think it's tough. I think, you know, so the answer from the legal standpoint is going to be, it's their risk if something happens and they can potentially be found liable, it's, you know, it's going to run into that. I don't know. What would you do if you lived there? Besides moving out, if you wanted to stay, what would you do? What would your avenue be? I, it's really going to that association board. <coughs> and getting that decision made. Uh, that's, okay. yeah, and, I, and I'll tell you, I don't know all the details of the situation and, and the structure of that, but that's, you know, obviously this community especially has a number of community associations and a lot of times I get calls and emails about people wanting to deal with problems in their community. And part of it is in the community association, when you buy in there, you've agreed to live by those rules. You've agreed to live by that board. If you don't like what that board's doing, your job then is to get enough support to change that board and, and get it done a different way. But it's really difficult and really policy proper for government to step in and start telling the private association what to do. Um, Again, if it's a pure health and safety type issue, then there's a chance for, for government to start stepping in. Safety from the standpoint of it being too dark so that something could happen that, that shouldn't be happening is not quite at that line. Again, just I'm talking generally from a legal standpoint. I will try to take a look at this a little bit more. But, but okay, anything that you could do, because I know they're suffering. Yeah, yeah understood. Thanks. Um, have you ever visited that site? No. Not, not at night when it's so, dark. Oh, okay. So. Here, I have some pictures okay. for you. So you can okay. look at what they're, what they're dealing with out there. Okay. Um, and also, this is located, as you know, within uh, the center of two, I mean, three separate schools. Right. So. I'd like to thank German, German Fubila, and uh, his honorable body in allowing me to direct my remarks to uh, German Apo, the City Council, City County of Honolulu. Uh, 
Um, Mr. Apo, um, I'd like to thank you for coming up with your your version in regards to the uh, cellular phone. And uh, we really need a bill like that in all of our books because one of the biggest abuse on our highways is having inattentive drivers so focused using the cellular phone and, um, you know, to avoid tragedies from happening, I think a lot like this is just simply justified. And um, I would hope that on the final reading, if the bill cannot be improved, I would hope you, that you would have an amendment to be inserted. Because your, your, um, your version to me has good clarity and is applicable and it's fair. Thank you. And nice shirt. I know he's a big softball player. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyone, anyone else on the committee? Right. Sorry, Todd. You know what you say about the cell phone having it in your hand or up to your ear? Why don't they have one of those Bluetooth? Completely fine. And you can hands free whether it's a Bluetooth or you know, a speaker system in your car, those are completely fine. So I said, the version that got passed out today is if you're holding it. And that's probably, even if you got a Bluetooth in here, if you're still holding it, you can get seven. You can get three more than seven. Oh, what if you have to hold the Bluetooth like this to get to ear when you can't hear it because of the screen? Well, as long as your phone, you it's, no, it's a matter of having a cell, my version is having your cell phone against your ear. So having your hand against your ear is not a problem. Just a quick question. Um, how le um, how likely is that to that version to pass and pass um, in the city council the the bill as it is as of this moment? Um, I don't know. Uh, there were there were four four members on the committee today that voted for it. Because just because they voted for it doesn't mean that they will continue to vote for it. I will make sure that my amendment is on the floor as a floor draft. Because uh, again, or I, I may even ask that they recommit it if you can't get it. As it. I just really don't like the idea of, of making it legal to be done in second. I don't think that addresses the safety issue that we're trying to get to. Okay, you want to thank you. Thank you. Four laws five. Board members and community members and the Board of Water Supply will be giving a report for the month of April. Uh, first, uh, there was one main break in the month of March. It occurred on March 10th. A 16-inch water main installed in 1957 broke at 91-2026 Parker Road near um, the West Lock Golf Course. So it was promptly fixed uh, um, a few hours after we discovered the leak. And so on, on top of the paper, we wanted to give you a, a report for our general water management for the month. And it has to do with water meter maintenance. Um, we wanted to discuss the customer and the VWS's responsibility in regards to maintaining and repairing the water meter and the pipes in your home. And for the VWS side, it is, um, we're committed to providing a safe and dependable water supply to our customers. And for us to do that, we have to make sure that we were, we're, made, we're maintaining pipes and we're testing the waters to make sure that the water that is delivered to your meter is um, safe to drink. So for the BWS's responsibility in regards to meter maintenance, we have to maintain and repair our water mains, the meter boxes, and the water meter itself. So that's what we're um, committed to doing at the BWS. And for our customers, uh, you are responsible for all water that is delivered after the meter to your home. So that's why it is critically important that property owners make sure that the pipes and water fixtures are well cared for and if there are any leaks, make sure you get the fixed property because um, you'll ultimately be paying for that in your, um, on your water bill or whatever water is wasted. And it's also important to keep the meter box area clean of any um, grass or debris so the BWS crew can um, if any maintenance is necessary, we can access it easily. So for, if, you, or if you have any questions about um, maintenance of your meter, you can call the Board of Water Supply at 748-5000. And any more information regarding that um, may be found on our website, www.waterwatersupply.com. And so that was a report for the month, but I also wanted to announce that 
Um, I will not be attending um, next month's meeting, so uh, if you have any questions, you may submit it to um, Ms. Nola, and she'll, she'll get that to me, and I'll follow up as best I can. And I also wanted to follow up on some concerns from last month's meeting. Firstly, there was a concerns on the aforementioned Maki Kula place. They wanted, there were two community members who wanted to know if they could have their homes individually metered, and as it was mentioned, we found that it was uh, it's private roads, it's private property, and the BW was only um, build a meter that is along the public right of way. So there's one meter along North Road, and so we cannot individually meter those homes just because it is private property, but um, we, in, we shared that with the residents and asked them if they could work with our developer to see if there's some way that they could have the developer look at the individual meters and um, build them according to consumption as opposed to um, dividing it equally. So that's uh, the information we shared with the residents. And uh, the other concern was uh, from Ms. Uh, Maquesta. I sent you a very long email, and I'm yeah. not going to go through the whole thing, but uh, if you have um, any questions about that, um, please let me know. Do you want to go for the board? Yeah, I have a Okay, please. I do have one question regarding that one email. You're saying that there's no inspectors on any development that's going on, any development lot? You know, any development that's going on, you have no inspectors? Not while they're developing their property. No, yeah, because that's how it was told to us last time that we had a water issue. Because in my home, Anyone who's a fire hydrant around where I live, I hear it in my home. And I had that problem for a long time and I still have that problem till today. So at that time when I spoke to them, they said that um, they do have an inspector. And the inspector came out late that night and found that a developer was using water. Uh, I don't know how far away from my property, but they could hear the water from where I am at, where I live and they're taking water out from the other property on the new development side, which that uh, particular um, hydro was not registered to for the water. And at that time I was told that the inspector should have been notified about that, so that is why I asked you about the inspectors and have it inspected. Okay, would you be able to, um, I mean, I'm not sure what inspector you spoke with, but I could follow with you, uh, follow with you after we can get some additional yeah, information and, and I'll, I'll do my best to do whatever I can to help you figure this out. Sure, that'll be great. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Really? Oh, thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, board business. Reviewing and accepting regular minutes from March 12, 2009. Any corrections? Yes, uh, board chair, so if I could be recognized. Um, page two of seven, proposed increase to videographer. Um, it says 200, but I believe it was 250. That there were no attachments to the money except that uh, a way could be made for if they want uh, the video, if they want Mr. or Ms. Bull to change anything, that they would speak with him about it. Typographical error, December 23, 2009 is a hell of a long, long way to get. Page 2. Page 2, second paragraph from the bottom. I think 
papers, page one. Uh, page two is the, uh, the discussion about the internet. Um, discussion followed. Belford said he would be in opposition of a school who does not have a free wireless. I said. I said that I was in opposition. Mm -hmm. that the school mm -hmm. does not. Have a free you want to send me an email with your correction? No, I want to state it, and then I'll send it. I said I was in opposition, and the school does not allow us to continue using the free taxpayer paid internet connection that is in this room that we've been using for about a year that was recently disconnected by the school. So my objection was, uh, I will send this to you, of course, and write it, but. My objection was not that I wanted free wireless. The DOE does not allow wireless on these campuses. Sorry. No, it's okay. It's awfully confusing. But I just want to make sure that those watching understand that, that we have an existing pay-for connection that we have been using for a year that was disconnected. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, can I have a motion to accept the minutes? Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, since we're on the video, um, James Campbell High School uh, won the uh, second place nationally. For, uh, so we just want to tell you thanks again. Uh, and wow, second in the nation. That's some blessing for our community. All right. Um, Moving on, um, Treasurer's Report. And so I'm going to make uh, the Treasurer's Report tonight, and then I'll, uh, I'm going to want to turn this thing over to somebody. Um, we have three accounts that we track, operating, publicity, and refreshments. Our operating budget, $1,520 a year. The things like facility rental, postage, lays, photography, registration, or interpreter services. That account with an annual budget of $1,500 has a current balance of $801.65. Our current monthly expense for the printing of the agenda and postage was $39.33, leaving a current balance mind you, of 762.32. We have a second account called Publicity. This is for maps, signs, and banners. Benefits to things like maps, signs, and banners are for those who are in the community who may be interested in getting involved to learn about this activity called the Monthly Neighborhood Board Meeting. Uh, we expense no money there. We have videotaping, advertising, and newsletter. Uh, we expense nothing for advertising or newsletter, and of our $2,500 annual budget, uh, we're now spending $3,000, that's 12 times 250, to pay James Campbell High School for videotaping. In doing this, we lost the live internet fee that I had been making available with the Department of Education Network here. That fed to publicity for free. We've now lost that. We are now paying $500 over budget for publicity, and we are not doing anything with respect to maps, signs, banners, advertising, or newsletters, which I think would be a bit more effective than going over budget and losing the internet connection. It was, we were the first neighborhood board ever to be live it fulfilled everything that the good senator has been working towards in the broadband task force. It fulfilled everything the good governor has called for. It fulfilled everything that the president has called for. So a publicity budget, excuse me, we're over. And um, I'll leave the next treasurer to deal with that. Refreshments is 120 a year. We still have 120. And with that, uh, in, in, in complete and bitter objection to the fact that we have gone over budget to pay our beloved high school money after our high school took away services that we had been using that we paid for. Uh, without this going out to bid, I believe I offered to do it myself 
Can you use this? Okay, uh, point of order. So um, uh, what you say? No, I, I think point I'll of order. Finish. No, I think I'll finish. Okay, and thank you. Uh, recess, five minutes. And the refreshment budget of 120 remains. Thank you.
one will be to the next one on the other side of the face. celebrating this nationally covered media event. Uh, so tune in to your cable broadcast and watch throughout the country on April 15th. Here in Hawaii, 4 to 7 p.m., State Capitol Atrium, free and open to the public, will be a rally regarding all the bills proposed this legislative session that will raise our taxes. So if you are concerned about holding on to your wallet, my announcement for this evening is to tune in on April 15th at the State Capitol, 4 to 7 p.m. Come down and uh, this is non-partisan event. It's strictly about holding on to your wallet. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, uh, Greg Vinny. Wait, hang on. Oh, sorry. Word check. Heard from Just hang on a second. I mean, this will just take a second. This was, um, you know, before you recessed for the treasurer's report. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that there's a hundred twenty dollar refreshment account that uh, this uh, board secretary Nola said has to be specifically spent on refreshment items, and I thought it would be appropriate if we honored uh, past uh, chair Rich Hardgrave and the Campbell Media. Uh, possibly at the next meeting uh, with these refreshments. Does this have, does this need board action? I believe the next meeting is the meeting it has to be set by okay. before we go to the next board. I do, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, let's bend it. Okay, let's, let's do that then. Um, so I'm going to make a motion that we use the $120 from the refreshment account that is to be used by the next meeting to honor uh, past chair Rich Hardgrave, who's with us here tonight, and the Campbell Media, um, and Mr. Ramisco. Okay, um, and also, um, since that's going to be our last um, for the right? And I think um, because um, Mr. Gary Bautista and Scott okay. Belford also and is to honor you know, all past uh, chair position holder. I mean, uh, yeah, position yes, holder. please, yes. All right. Um, can we take a little, a little? Yeah, for me. Is there a second? Yeah. Okay. There's. Is there, are we in session? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, okay, if you can help me out, is is the money in this? Account. Is the money in the food account, if unused, go back into the coffers to help balance our city budget? So we could exercise as a board the fact that we can 
recognize our volunteers in this community who have come forward to provide their time and energy and efforts to advance our community in other ways. And I would rather, in this discussion of this motion, advise that the motion be withdrawn and that rather the monies lapse and thereby the monies go back to the city coffers. Okay. No second. I'll let go. Okay, can we have a roll call vote then? Okay. All right. Call for the question. Okay. Call for the vote. Gary Bautista. Aye. Scott Gomford. Oh, no, thank you. Tom Burr. No. Kurt Fabella. Yes. Eden Hour. I'm staying. Jolette McQuesta. Yes. Richard Tanani. Yes. I have four eyes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Kobe. That's okay. I got a good one. I have five eyes, two knees, and one extension. So it's uh, yes. Motion fails. Okay, motion fails for now. Any other announcements? Great, Debbie. Thank you. I'd like to announce that um, Ever Weed and Seed, in cooperation with Empower Oahu, would like to invite you, uh, everybody here in Ever, to a meeting next week Wednesday. It starts at 6.30 at the Boys and Girls Club. And the purpose of this meeting is it's the initial step to uh, form a, an Ever community-based development organization. It's where uh, community residents get together. They they are empowered to make decisions and try to see how they can better the community. So I encourage everybody to come out. Dinner will be served, and dinner will be served, so served starting at 6.30, and we'll start the meeting shortly thereafter. We go at 6.45 or 7 o'clock. Next week, Wednesday. That's uh, April 15th. All right. Good. Is this one partial? Partial. All right. Hi, I'm George Shido. My number is on this flyer, and that's my friend Cal. Can we have one? Can we have one? Can we have one? Yeah. Please, thank you. And we're having this car show to prevent domestic violence, to make it aware. Yeah. And we've been sponsored by NAMPA and Oana Cruz. And what we want to do is bring out all the cars and lure the public so that they can be educated. All the information is on this flyer. We're passing it out to all the, the car clubs, invited the whole public free. There'll be lots of food, prizes, and information. Because that's what we want to do is prevent domestic violence. All right, no, no. Perfect. Are you going to have high heels? Are you going to have high heels? That was a nice song. Yeah, it's kind of nice. Okay, why would we be there? We be there to support. Thank you. Okay? Yes. Did you guys invite the guys from Kai, um, Hawaii Kai, the hot rodders from Hawaii Kai? Too? We will, yes. And this Saturday we're going to meet at uh, Mililani and hand out some more flyers to those car clubs. But we wanted to get Maui to come over. Now that's not a possibility because of the super yeah. Yeah. They're very eager. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, yeah, to uh, thank uh, our representative Karen. I wanted to uh, help us to get the uh, space out in Barbersport. And then this is, uh, you know, for, for all the people of Hawaii to come together and uh, as, as one, we can really help the uh, domestic violence uh, people out here. And, uh, and we use it the car show as, uh, to attract the people to come. And then uh, I, I know uh, we want uh, from like one 
one man mechanic shop to a big box stores to just come and donate uh, donate funds that or their time and, and help help us with this crisis. And uh, that's all we want to do. Because it's not just the women that are getting abused. The children are too. And we want them to know what to do. Thank you. What, what, what do you guys name? Um, we just know why. <laughs> we're just having a car show, we're just orchestrating this, we're just you know, using all our, our resources. Hot rods, four pounds. Hot rods, four pounds. Alright, alright. Hopefully, this is not you guys' last song. Yeah, we're using your guys' first annual. We'll have another one next year. Oh, yeah. Okay. Concerns? Okay, anybody have any more announcements? Um, yeah. Rich? Okay, Andrew Board, uh, just real quick, I uh, wanted to mention that Pride Forever, of course, is every year, and uh, don't want you guys to forget, I want to make sure that the community is out there also. This is going to be on the 9th of May, Pride Forever, it starts at 9 o'clock in the morning, go through it about 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, they are still looking for um, some exhibitors, uh, sponsors, and uh, crafters. So if the, you guys uh, have any kind of interest or know of anybody, get them to make contact with everybody Gentry and uh, get set up for Pride Forever. Great. Over the years, Gentry has earned a reputation for innovative land use planning and the production of competitively priced homes. And in fact, our target market has generally been the first time home buyer. Although recently we have expanded our market to include move-up buyers as well. Um, we've gone through several rezonings and today, 22 years later, we're about 80% complete in the development of Ever by Gentry. Um, the orange areas represent the homes that have already been built and sold. As of December 31st, 2008, 6,741 homes in Everby Gentry were sold and closed, including those in Trovari and Kulale, which were develop developed by other than Ever um, Gentry homes, out of a total of 8,500 homes that filled out. Approximately 1550 homes remain to be built and sold in the remaining areas shown in purple and pink. The purple areas represent areas that are currently under construction. We have Haleakea, which is a single family um, project consisting of approximately 68 homes. The Latitudes, which is a zero lot line single family project. Um, consisting of about 285 homes, and of those, about 38 have been sold. And then we have a new development which will be coming on the market very shortly. It's called the Tides. Um, the Tides and Trades are uh, single family condominiums consisting of 415 units total. All of the homes that we currently sell in Ever by Gentry are Energy Star rated, and we've recently made it a company policy to build all of our homes using built green stand features, including the installation of solar water heaters. I believe that we were the first major residential developer on Oahu to do so. We also provide photovoltaic systems as an option. With respect to infrastructure, most of our major roadways within our development have been completed, including Copley Parkway, which opened in October 2006. I guess I gave you um, all copies of the master plan so you can kind of follow along on your sheets. Uh, Keanu Drive, the final stretches of which opened in October 2007. The wastewater pump station at Cop on Copper Lake Parkway is now under construction and should be completed by sometime next month. Regarding the Eva Mackay School, Gentry will be donating um, 18 and a half acres of land to the DOE for construction of a new middle school. It's going to be beautiful and state of the art. Uh, bids were opened in December of last year, and a contractor, Nordic Construction, has been selected. Construction is slated to begin 
as soon as they get their grading permits, hopefully by the end of this month. And they have a targeted opening date of July 2010. Any questions? Any questions from the board? For the community? Oh, thank you, Daddy. Okay. Oh, we're <clears throat> yeah, I wondered if, if your developers knew about the, one of the latest developments that I heard about. They actually have photo tape or whatever, whatever the word is, um, like tiles, actual size of tiles for roofing. So instead of putting a, a big sheet uh, across your roof, you can actually have like, uh, you know, Roofing materials that will look just like a regular roof. I'm not sure if they've looked into it yet. Um, I know that we are striving very hard to um, try to see if we can price it such that we can include photovoltaic on each house that we build. I think that would be awesome. Um, I think it's, cost is still an issue. We need to work on some of that. I guess we can look into that. Uh, very quickly, you know, uh, you're so cognizant of all the demands of the community um, that you've had to fluctuate and change your plans over and over. You've moved things, you've shifted things, and um, I think that your efforts over a decade plus have been just outstanding, that you've come so forward and transparent, and I, and I each and every step of the way. One of the things that's come up, though, has been the why we don't guide your vote of its completion. And you, you folks have said, we're ready to do it. But then the state had its delay on the widening of Fort Weaver. And I recall that you said, you know what? We're not going to do Geiger when everyone else is in construction. We want everybody else to be powered so that when we do our construction, we're not negating other, you know, rerouting. So what's going on with Geiger Road? OK, OK. I, I think there's some misunderstanding with respect to Geiger. We had been ready to go. Um, development of that parcel has been delayed. Um, we've attempted to sell it. We're not uh, industrial developers or um, commercial developers, but the market is such that we have no buyers at the moment. I think uh, when that parcel is sold and ready to be developed, you'll see back the road going in. Um, there's another issue that we need to resolve, and that is we have the roadway plan for our de to take care of our development. But um, there's half of the road in front of the wastewater treatment facility. And so that would be the city's Kuleana. And I don't think that they are prepared at the moment to um, design and build the road. We had offered to um, perhaps um, get sewer but, you know, credits or something if we were to build a road for it, design and build it, because it makes sense for us to do it all at one time. But um, I guess uh, there's some discussion that um, there are two different departments. One is Department of Transportation Services, and one is the, um, I guess, uh, Department of Voice uh, Environmental Services. And so, um, and that needs to still be worked out. There's also another parcel of land that um, fronts another com um, commercial industrial property that is um, has been recently rezoned. I believe. So 
we need to work it out with that developer as well. So there's three different players involved with the widening of that road. Does that make sense? All right. How are you doing this evening? Um, just to re-clarify, um, is our Campbell High School going to be enough for all the residents to um, for high school kids to go to? I remember. I'm not clear on the story. I remember. You guys are building a middle, and Haseko is building the elementary, or something like that. Can you explain that to all of us? I know that Capital High School is very crowded, and I believe that if Fort Kinney goes in, is it going to be a high school yeah. plan for Fort Kinney? Okay. So then everything will be resolved? I assume so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, then it went a little bit of time, I can't move me kids flooding the classroom, so <laughs> anyway, they run on a whole cycle. Well, then we want to thank you for the, um, thank you for the money for the bash. It was a total success, yes. And a cycle and Grace Pacific and McDonald's and home oh, shops, Horton. Uh, what else? Uh, Silver Store, many people. But anyway, thank all of them who supported our bash. It was really successful. A lot of kids enjoy themselves. Okay. Thank you. And I cannot forget Generator Sawai. Without them powering it up, nothing would have moved. Thank you very much. Good evening, Chair and Board Members. I'm Anissa Nanoria from Haseko. And I just have a few things to bring up. Um, first off, our contractors finished repaving the Malka side of Kapipi Road over spring break. They've added in curves along the edge of the road, and in the next few weeks we'll be planting trees and grass in the landscaping strips fronting the school. Um, as you may recall, the Seiko's contra contractors began making drainage improvements in front of the school as part of phase two of the PPP drainage improvement project. But the work stopped after an opponent, ah, opponent appealed the state's decision to permit the ocean outlet, which is needed to complete the drainage system. The opponent, Michael Lee, has also asked the land board to completely dismiss the application for the outlet. Thanks to the city for allowing us to finish up the work funding the school. Um, also, the next thing that I have to bring up is a friendly reminder the deadline to apply for a grant from Elk Beach Community Fund is coming up on April 24th. Haseko helped, Haseko helped create this endowed fund for the benefit of Elk Beach residents more than a decade ago. And since 1996, the fund has awarded more than 113,000 in grants to groups and organizations that provide services and or events for Elk Beach keikis and seniors. So the Hawaii Community Foundation administers the fund, and for more information, you can call them at 566-5550. And that's all I have. You guys have questions? Um, yeah. I'm not sure if you were here earlier, and I mentioned about the trees. Okay, yeah. Do you know, are they going to be planting the same kind of trees in front of the school? Um, I'm not sure what's um, going to be planted there, but I can follow up and see. Yeah, and you can also let her know that about what had happened and maybe if they could change the trees. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we don't like any more bots in the community. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh. Hi, Derek. Oh, hi. Oh, Anyone else? Community? Uh, yeah. Oh, good. Uh, Marshall Chair, I just 
want to let you folks know that the Lions Club has officially adopted only Lula Beach Park uh, for the adoptive park of the city and county. So we look forward to working with you folks to help secure and help with the events and cleanups and all that. So again, yeah, this town street, everybody in the sickle will not take any help. We will have a successful day on Saturday. Thank you guys very much. Okay, moving on. Unfinished business, man. Uh, new business. Um, remember, not here from the audience, but he had a good, um, excuse me, a good idea for the Ever Development Plan town meeting. He wanted us to maybe write a letter to the city to have three meetings, one in Ever Beach, one in Waipaho, and one in Kapolei, to have somebody from the city to go more in depth into the Ever Development Plan so that we can get more um, educated on the subject of what really impacts the community of Ever Beach and the adjacent community. So um, can I get a motion to, um, yes. Oh, there's any objections here, sorry. To, to, to the board sending this letter? Um, not, then we're gonna write this letter to um, roll. And we'll go right up to that guy. And, and, and we're gonna CC everybody else. Okay, moving on, um, let me see, uh, Ken, um, Board of Education. Good evening, Green Hard Board, Board of Education, Lima District member. Um, there's a lot going on in education, as you know. Um, we just had some meetings about the school closure issues. Um, we're having public hearings about the uh, administrative rule changes. Um, but what I wanted to talk about tonight was the issue of the budget. It continues to be a huge issue, and of course what's been in the news is the uh, stimulus money that's coming to us. So I would like to take a few minutes to explain that to the board and the community. It, this is very complicated, so I'm going to try to boil it down uh, into a, a, as quick a presentation as I can. Um, I'm going to skip over a lot of details, so if you do have questions, I can answer. Uh, let me just start by, by setting the, the scene. Uh, as you know, we're already short. Uh, we, we have um, already um, cut our budget significantly this school year. And going into next school year, um, the current projection is something like over $80 million short next school year. And of course, the state's budget is not done yet, so we'll see what really comes out of it. But significantly short. Um, now, what's happening is we're getting a lot of the um, uh, state, uh, I'm sorry, federal stimulus money coming to us. So let me explain that a little bit. Um, the federal stimulus money, what we call the stimulus money, really is a bunch of different pockets of, of money coming to everyone. Um, but what I'm going to talk about tonight is the what's called the State Fiscal Stabilization Fund, SFSF. Okay, that's just one portion of the federal stimulus money, but I'm just gonna call it stimulus just uh, because it's easier for me. Uh, a total of $192.2 million is coming to Hawaii. That's Hawaii's share of this. This is, um, as uh, Chair Paul said earlier, this is what's called the, the formula money that's coming to Hawaii. $192.2 million. And there's two parts to this. What we call Part A is 81.8% of this is for education, which is a total of $157.2 million is for education. And according to the feds, that's to restore state support for higher and lower education and to improve basic education programs. Okay, now all of this $157.2 million that has to be shared between the UH and the DOE. The UH is by, by internal agreement, the UH will take 28% or 44 million, and the DOE will take 72%, which is 113 million. If you remember that number now, 113 million. The other part of it, part B, the remaining portion, the 18.2%, is for everything else in the state. That's 35 million. It gets, gets a little confusing, but that's, that's what we're 
uh, getting from the fence. Now here's where it gets a little um, involved. The governor's plan, as you probably heard in the news, is to take $90.9 million away from the DOE this current school year. This current school year. Next school year, she's going to take another $22.3 million away from the DOE. If you add that up, that's the $113 million that the feds targeted for the DOE. So, her plan, take away this money. When the federal stimulus money comes, give it back. Um, I think we can all add and subtract, and that means the net is zero. That's her plan. Um, of course, we have some concerns with that plan. Many concerns with that plan. Um, number one is the, uh, the governor has to sign off on this request, this application form to the federal government to get this money. Part of the application is that the state needs to give certain assurances to the feds in order to get this money. Now, all of these assurances, well, let me say, some of them are achieve equity in teacher distribution, improving in collection and use of data, enhance quality of academic assessments, support struggling schools. These are all the things the feds want us to move forward with. Okay. These are things that the DOE must deliver on, but the governor is giving the assurances, but the DOE is to deliver. Okay, now, we have no assurance that the money is gonna to come to us, or we don't know when it's gonna to come to us, and that's a real concern because the superintendent's assessment is that if this money is taken away from us, this nine million, and it's not replaced, we're gonna run out of money by, by about May 6th. That's a real concern. Um, we also have huge deficits projected for next school year. So that's a real concern. Um, the new part of it is the 35 million that the governor says that they're gonna use part of that for education. We don't know how much. But the real concern is how much money will it take us to, to provide these assurances or to deliver on these assurances? Nobody knows. There's been no discussion or assessment. So we have large concerns that the governor is intending to sign off on these assurances to get the money. But we don't know how much it's going to take for us to do these things. Large concerns all over, and I know I'm running out of time, so I think I'll stop with one, one last uh, quote from the, the uh, something like 54-page guidelines that just come, came out recently from the feds. This is a quote from the federal guidelines. The governor may not retain any portion of the Education Stabilization Fund for state purposes, nor award any portion of this allocation to entities other than LEAs and IHs, which for us means the DOE and the UH. Large concerns. Thank you. Um, what's missing in this scenario is, is, is of interest. The recovery, or uh, yeah, the Federal Recovery Act, right? That's where the state stabilization money is coming from. The act was written by Congress with the assumption that all 50 states have been suffering economically since 06, that their Department of Education budgets have decreased. So the assumption made in the Recovery Act is that since 06, all 50 states have cut education. But Hawaii is only one of two states in the nation that doesn't fit that model. The state of Hawaii has increased its Department of Education budget since 06. So what the governor, in my opinion, has brought forward and advanced for discussion, not only did the Senate concur, Ways and Means Committee, that the governor's plan was right on the money, was the right thing to do, would balance the budget, is, is that I think the media and the communication going back and forth has missed that one fact. Is, is that if we were to follow the, what you just last read, that the, that the guidelines are you can only expend if you follow these requisites. It's applicable to those states where their budget goes back to 06. You've got to wind, wind the clock back. Go back, gang, to 06 budget. If we do, <laughs> we're going in the opposite direction. We're going back to 1.9 billion. So the point is, is that this plan, is, that I understand it, no schools will be shut down. No one's going to run out of money. No one's losing money. There won't be 24 days of no school. 
all this uh, discussion has to do with that, what you just brought forward for clarity. And again, if we apply the Recovery Act language that you go back to 06 dollars, the Department of Education is not losing a penny. Let me respond real quickly to that. The, the 06 is, is the baseline year. There's no assumption anywhere that we have lost uh, money. The, the, key, the key is that we need to, in order to get this money, we need to provide these assurances. It'll take a lot of money. I don't know how much, but it's going to take a lot of money for us to deliver on these assurances. Money that we don't have. We, this year's budget already has decreased. Next year is significant more de decrease. So whether we've increased or decreased over the past couple of years is, is almost irrelevant in this analysis. What is the governor's office saying uh, as the reason that they're taking this money? Um, I pause because I'm not sure how to answer that. <laughs> I, I, have, I, I, have, I have my own feelings, but let me just say, let me just say that if you look at the governor's um, um, newsletter, there is no mention, absolutely no mention in this newsletter that the plan is to take away $115 million from the union. So I'll leave it at that. Mr. Chair, I've heard from other boards on the, the issue of education and how the state, in its failure in providing the support to the Department of Education, and where schools are pointing to each other who should close and who should stay open. Uh, that adds a very dark chapter to our educational system for our children in the city of Hawaii. If any project or any money item should have high priority other than public safety, it should be our education. And I would urge this honorable body in supporting the Department of Education in receiving maybe not all what they need or, or requesting but at least funding from our state in meeting a very critical needs of it, in ed educating our children. Um, if the stimulus package that is just, has just come down from Congress and the President of the United States, or President Obama, is our only way of support, then we are in real deep, deep trouble. Um, one way I would urge, and maybe we can take this up as a uh, idea of thought, which I've heard brought up in other boards. Our city council, our mayor, the department heads have taken paid freezes. Our city council itself worked 12 months in a year. Our state legislature have an off period. I would urge that we let President of the Senate, uh, Hanabusa, Chairman Calvin say that they should consider taking pay freeze and urge their bodies to take the, to follow suit. This will give a strong message to the state of Hawaii and our children how much of a commitment government had in supporting their needs. And I cannot say enough about education. Um, all my children went to private school. So I would be a hypocrite if I fight for something that is not happening. I wanted to put my grandchildren into private school. It becomes an economic problem because of fixed income. But they are in a system, and I'm proud to say, my grandchildren are excelling. Two valedictorian candidates, and even my grandson, so 
I didn't expect too much progress out of a maintaining three point average. So again, I can expound and the urgency of your support to the Department of Education. Thank you. Thank you, members of the board. I'm Tommy Johnson, the Deputy Director of Corrections for the Department of Public Safety. I just have a few announcements uh, really quickly. The um, couple of events, <clears throat> the state's education executive officer of the union received a $485,000 U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uh, grant to be used for award for uh, meals for seniors and for delivery of meals. In addition, there will be a conference provided to seniors on protecting themselves against fraud on April 25th, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Hawaii Convention Center. And the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations would like to announce that starting on the 1st of April, it has increased the hours of its Kaneohe satellite offices uh, located at the atrium building at 46-005 Kaaba Street, Suite 205 from 7.45 to 4.30 p.m. And workforce development will be available the same time Monday through Wednesday. With that, that's all I have, unless you have additional questions. Uh, excuse me, Anyone else on the board? Yeah, um, the only reason I voted for Bingo is because she promised to improve our educational system. As far as I'm concerned, she's utterly failed in every single way. I'm very angry about it. Our schools have gotten worse. They don't have textbooks. They don't have air conditioning. And she's been in office for quite a while. And as far as I'm concerned, she's done nothing. What does she propose to do now? Take the money that the feds will give us to improve our schools? I want to know why she's doing this. If I may, I believe where Board Member Bird hit the nail right on the head when he said that the Department of Education's budget is one of only a few states in the nation that it, it increased, in fact, increased substantially since 2006. In addition, with your respect to your questions regarding air conditioning and schools being in disrepair, the Department of Education lacks between 20 and $30 million a year that the legislature provides for it for maintenance of the schools. I think if you want to ask questions about the state of the schools, that should be directed to the superintendent of the schools who has control over the budget for the schools. Okay, as far as the budget, I mean, this is a very bright lady. Okay, with all this development that is going on, she cannot say, you know, she has to know how many students are going to the schools. She has to know what the school is in need of. She has to know, you know. Um, granted, you know, she is a nice lady, but turn around, I would never vote for her again as well. Good. Uh, aloha. Aloha. Um, first of all, uh, science, technology, engineering, math, STEM. Prior to this administration, we didn't know what STEM was. Okay? And robotics. And if we really look back in this administration of Governor Lingo, uh, I think that the uh, record stands for itself that our schools have achieved. I think Green here, representing the Board of Education, would concur that our teachers have excelled with their students, that they've made advancements and strides like never before. And I look at the last uh, six, seven years of this administration, I just want to say, that robotics and STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, have been advanced by this administration. Um, and let's just get one thing clear here, is that for the last two, three, four decades, the rate of number of ratio of students enrolled in the Department of Education, or in the 40 complexes rather, uh, that number hasn't increased. So we have the same level when Linda Smith came here 
two years ago with the governor's administration, brought out dime by dime, penny by penny, budget by budget, and gave everyone here transparency like never before. I can't recall in statehood somebody coming to this community of any administration other than this administration to say, here's the facts, here's the figures, here's where the balanced budget lies, here's what we're doing. So the advancements, in my opinion, is that I think the governor's administration has been outstanding and has a lot to be thankful for, uh, for their achievements. And this isn't brown nosing you, this isn't dystropia, but I really do think that if we, if, we think, if we think about it, put it in perspective, and get rid of the R and the D, I think Green sitting back here will tell you that this, this education in our community has made a lot of strides. Thank you. Uh, all right, uh, uh, quick question for me now. Sure. When the pay raises or the pay raises was or you're supposed to go retroactive or put in, did the representatives, the House and the State Senate and the Governor receive these pay raises uh, in January? I think that the legislature received the 36% pay raise effective 1 January. I'm not sure about the Governor, but I can tell you that the directors and the deputies and certain tiers received a pay raise on 1 July of last year. The only reason why I say that is because I recall <clears throat> during the campaign trail that uh, our representatives in the area said um, if we would come to the crisis of uh, having this, what we're going through right now, that they would speak boldly against getting the pay raise. And as uh, far as I know, I didn't hear anything. I think Not so much from the governor's side, but they said that they would they would voice their opinion on opposition to getting this pay raise, knowing that their people or their community is hurting, their elderly people is hurting, uh, you know, the people on uh, low income is hurting. Uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff I want to know because to me, if you could wait on that and everybody do what what we're saying, education it seems like always the first thing to go. Uh, you know, I mean, we should make a law that that should be the last, and public safety. And like I said, um, um, John came up and said that on behalf of the board, after we talk to you, we're going to see if we can uh, write a letter to have the, the governor uh, reconsider in the sense of taking that money from the Board of Education, even if it's rumors of closing up a school in Aina Haina. Um, the kids on the TV look real. Uh, the teachers look real. They look like they were scared that the school was going to close, but I don't know, maybe it was just an act. I'm not sure. But can you find out for us, and if they did take the pay raise, why nobody from our area ever opposed their pay raise? Okay. So uh, let, me, let me start by two issues you want to know. If any of the local legislators in this area opposed the pay raise that they were going to receive, and two, if the... Yes, Lori, that matter. Uh, May 6th, and I believe there is a phone number too if you have any questions. A couple community items I'd like to briefly mention. Uh, behind OLPH, Our Lady Perpetual Health, the housing development, it was mentioned earlier, um, the city and county has gone out there and they have been cited and asked to clean up the debris and the mess and uh, the dumping. And they have the property owner has 30 days to clean up the mess. Um, if they are not cleaned up by then, uh, the city and county will go back again and uh, cite them and give them, I think, a little more time, after which time, if it, if it is not done, it will be turned over to the city attorneys uh, who may be able to put a lien on the property and even possibly foreclose, depending on um, what the property owners do. So there is something that is moving on that. I've been in touch with the property owner regarding putting up the fence along the sidewalk and adjacent to Kaimi Low Elementary School. Um, I haven't received anything concrete regarding the fence, um, but we are working on it, and the fire department has also gone out there, inspected it, and have fined them and asked them to clean up some stuff regarding the, the mess. Um, also, I did receive some calls from some Westlock Fairways residents, and at that intersection of Westlock Fairways, prior to the lights, there are solid lines, so people are not um, switching lanes um, as they're going through. Uh, but on the opposite side, on the north side of the uh, interchange, um, 
and it was a freeway for our no solid lines. So I have been in touch with the Department of Transportation and they will be looking at putting some solid lines so when cars are leaving Westlock fairways, um, it will be a little safer and they won't have to contend with vehicles uh, switching lanes right at that intersection area. And we did also get some concerns regarding the, the bridge along the golf courses um, between Westlock Fairways and Westlock Estates. As you know, there's that bridge, uh, pedestrian walkway that the uh, contractors put up. And there's just some concerns about making sure that the rocks and everything in that area is secure and possibly cemented down so there's not vandalism or you know how kids and teenagers can be when there's loose things laying around. So we're hoping that the Department of Transportation and the vendor will be looking at uh, making that area more secure and, uh, and strong. As you know, we've got about two to three weeks left in the state legislature. Um, the hot issue uh, outside of the budget has been civil unions. Today was the deadline. The House of Representatives passed over a bill uh, today was the deadline for the Senate to act on amending the bill that they passed over. Uh, the Senate did not act on it, as you know. So at this time, in terms of amending HB 444, uh, which uh, was very contentious and controversial depending on your position, there will be no amendments to HB 444. However, um, until the end of the session, there's always a possibility that um, someone might attempt to pull it from committee again. Uh, that effort was done once, as you may remember, and nine senators had to vote to pull it, only six voted, and thus it failed. So between now and the end of session, if there's an attempt to pull the bill, it will be to pull the original bill and no amendments can be made at this time. So whether that will happen again, I do not know. I personally don't think it will happen. However, until the end of session, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, Karen's law, um, the law that has to do with um, trying minors and adults is moving forward. Um, it did pass the Senate Judiciary Committee and uh, it was changed though from first degree and second degree murder to just first degree murder. So that uh, measure will be going to conference. Um, there's also some resolutions regarding our area. One resolution has to do with Eva Field and getting support and just showing the legislature support that a portion of Eva Field is preserved. And then we also have a resolution that's asking the DOT and the DTS and other stakeholders and the developers to look at um, establishing a public ferry landing at the new Ocean Point or Hawaka Lake Marina in the future. That's about it for now. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes. I uh, want to comment, Senator, if you can comment. It's really not a question, it's an observation. Um, you had introduced a bill that would, uh, in the last two years of one being incarcerated, right. that, that, albeit one is being, uh, serving their time and penalized and sentenced for a crime, you want to restore in those last two years of remaining in their sentence, their, if I understand you correctly, their ability to vote. So you want to restore the rights of an incarcerated inmate to vote while in prison. And my understanding is the bill says that your last registered address at the time of your arrest serves as your voting, your registration for your vote. Now my, yes. my, my comment is, is it's kind of, kind of a contrast. Representative Pine got on the House floor, voted no on your measure with the following statement and said that, you know, that's one of the that's one of the deterrents that we offer is, is that when you are caught, for instance, if you are identity theft and you're ripping off people's IDs and you you got ten aliases, the concern that Pine had was that if somebody's in jail for stealing your identity and has everyone here's social security number. Can that person be trusted before their sentence is served that you want to give that person the right to vote? And I just wonder if you wanted to comment on that because Sen uh, Representative Cavanilla supports your measure and voted yes. So we got Red Pine saying, don't restore the voting rights for someone serving time. Wait till they get out of prison. 
you can have your voting rights restored. Do your time. Uh, so Cabanelli and yourself want to give the prisoner, the inmate who's doing time and being punished for a crime, you want to restore that voting right. And I, I appreciate your comments. Yes, this has to go with the whole debate on our prison system over the last 30 years. And um, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, there was a huge increase in the amount of individuals, not only in Hawaii, but in the nation, who are incarcerated. The United States, as an industrialized nation, has one of the highest incarceration rates in the nation. Uh, there was recently a Pew Center study that showed today one in 100 citizens is incarcerated. Um, I've visited all of our prisons in the state, and I've also gone to Arizona to check up on the 1,800 inmates that we have there. And Speaking with uh, many ACOs and people within the prison system, uh, there's a feeling that maybe anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of the individuals who are incarcerated today do not have to be incarcerated. Uh, many for nonviolent offenses and offenses where they can be rehabilitated and monitored outside of prison. Currently, we're spending over $250 million per year um, in our Department of Public Safety, with the majority of that going for our incarcerated prisoners. And money spent in our prison system um, is money taken away from our schools, from our social services, um, from our infrastructure. So what we've been looking at over the last few years is re-entry and rehabilitation. And I polled uh, a few times um, some unofficial polls, but the majority of the residents do believe that you just cannot take a person and put them in jail and forget about them. That while they are in jail, if and where we can, we should provide some rehabilitation and attempt to improve their lives. Because most of the people, we have 6,000 prisoners today, um, most of them will be in for less than 10 years. And 95% at least will be released so what does that mean? Those are going to be our neighbors, those are going to be our co-workers. Eva Beach and Waipahu has a large number of former inmates. And if we don't help these people when we have an opportunity, then we're going to have this recidivism problem. That revolving door, which when you see a newspaper account recently, you'll see something, someone has 20 arrests, 10 convictions, 50 arrests, 35 convictions. Something's wrong with the system. And the re-entry and re rehabilitation program is a way to help these citizens become more productive members of our society. Now getting to the question on voting, I could talk all night on this, but this is just an effort. Two states right now allow inmates to vote, Maine and Vermont. And those two states have no problems at all. But for the majority of the inmates, they don't vote. They're just like our general public. So if we were to say um, X amount of the inmates have this opportunity to vote, my guess is 5% or less would actually vote. But from my perspective, for that 5%, whether that's 10 inmates or 50 inmates, these are probably the inmates who have already had some rehabilitation and have realized I need to better my life and I need to be involved and possibly I need to vote because I have a child going to school or I have an elderly mother or I have a spouse that has problems and we're hoping that the few who do vote, I don't expect you're going to see a large amount, um, that they would be turning their lives around and contributing, although it is through jail, but at least um, with two years or less, they're soon gonna be out and within our neighborhoods, walking with us, eating with us, so that was the intent of the measure. Um, right now, the measure has stalled in the House Judiciary Committee. Um, I spoke with Representative Karamatsu, and he would like to revisit it next year, but he just wants to look at a couple things before he does. But this is purely an opportunity and intended to help these people who are in prison so that when they get 
back in our society, um, they have at least an idea of what's going on. Um, they might be a little more proactive in, in getting involved in the community or, or being a better person. That is the intention. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say real quick, I'd like to remind people in the audience at home as well as the audience here, one of the main tenets of Christianity is to forgive, forgive with love. And this is the way we show that uh, America being one of the industrial countries that has the most per capita people in jail, I don't think we're doing a real good job of forgiving with love. Um, I'm sorry, but I, I have to disagree with you on this because when our boys went out to Iraq, we had a very big problem on having them, you know, cast in votes. Now, and you're gonna, you're gonna come here and try to push something that we're gonna have the prisoners give them a chance to vote? I mean, we get men dying for us out there, and we had a problem with that. Well, if there are problems, kind of problems. But the, the whole problem is, is that we have good men that we, we're giving them problem in voting. Whereas, you know, we have prison, you try to push the prisoners to vote. I don't think, Willie, I mean, you're a nice guy, but I don't know where your mind is going. Thank you for your comments, Les. Can anyone from the community? Oh, here, Red Pine. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, brother. Sure, I know. Um, my question is about the um, Kiwi Kuno place. Okay, I'm speaking in charge. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My name is Christopher Clark, and I live in uh, right up across the street from uh, Incors Point. So, um, my question is about the my, my K Kuno place project. Yes, we have the LPH. Yes. Yeah, my K Kuno. Um, now, you had said that you had certain people coming and inspecting. Yes, from the city and county um, government. Do you, know, do you know exactly who was came to inspect it? Was uh, I have their names, I believe. Uh, my staff member has been working with them. But the fire department staff went, and I believe some people from um, planning and permitting as well. Okay. I, I would just ask, you know, somebody from EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, some of those guys would come out, because uh, if they got, like, hazards out there, there's real, like, hazardous waste, those fines could be really detrimental to, to the person who has said just left stuff out for the kids to get into because the kids get into hazardous waste and get on their skin or get inside their body, they can actually die from that. I have followed up with the fire department because I believe the fire department um, has the capability of looking at um, hazardous and chemical materials. So we will follow up and get back to that. Carol Cox did the uh, auto. Did a lot of investigation of them. He has all the information on what he found out there. But what I found out is that the fire department, not our local one, but the one that goes out to the property, did inspect it and did find the developer or the owner of the property. I didn't get a chance to ask the uh, fire chief because they left to a fire tonight. So next month I'll make sure I have that exact time that they went there. And when did they expect it? And when did they find it, um, the owner of the property? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, moving on thank to. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're going to move to committee reports. Legislative Tower. Aloha, everyone. Let's make this very quick. There is a handout so that we can all follow along. And in the handout, there are some resolutions. And I'd like to address if you can all take a look at the chalkboard behind you. On the chalkboard, you see an HCR 108. And in the handout, in the handout, if you could go to the second to last page, board members, and there are plenty of copies for the community. There's a community member who, by the name of Pearl Arakaki, had brought this to my attention on a Resolution introduced to change the street name, of, street name of Fort Ferris. I can't do Earl Arakaki justice. I can't. I'm not a Kapuna. You know, I, I really am not the one to speak on this. But in in the legislative committee meeting that was held last night on Wednesday at Austin Park uh, on, on April 8th, 
is this matter was brought up with uh, two other measures. And so we advanced at the legislative committee. I have the three measures before us. Um, I, I believe that if we take them one step at a time, Chair, uh, I'm asking for your indulgence that we take uh, House Concurrent Resolution 108 uh, relating to changing the street name of Fort Barrett Road that this board provide tonight and take a position. And my motion is, is that the Evan Neighborhood Board sends uh, testimony uh, to the legislative body in opposition to renaming of Fort Barrett Road. So my motion stands that the Evan Neighborhood Board take a position in opposition to HCR 108, whereby the name of Fort Barrett Road is retained. Is there a second, Chair? A second. You're saying you want Fort Barrett to remain? That is correct. Okay. I second. Okay. Okay. Are you still going to take uh, yes, all in favor? Aye, aye. aye. And all opposed? No opposed? Okay. Thank, thank you. Oh, I first. Oh, you see that somebody has submitted a, a bill to uh, change Fort Barrett Road to another name? And what he's saying is that he want to keep it at Fort Barrett Road. Instead of changing the name. Okay, I, and I'll still have to abstain because okay. I don't know the whole issue. Oh, I'm sorry, what I'm saying, um, and the rest, I don't so. Okay, so, so, so board members, Chair Favela, uh, if you would indulge me, we can, we can wrap up the other two very quickly. Uh, the, first in front, the first in front page is HCR 291. This is, this is something of which uh, has to do with building the roads first, uh, an analysis whereby the Oahu Metropolitan Planning Organization in this resolution merely just talk story with Bob Stanfield on the Evan Belton plan. Right now, there's a there's like a schism or a rift whereby the Ample Policy Committee sets down fiscal constraints category and says these roads will be uh, funded in a two-year cycle. We have an ORTP, Oahu Regional Transportation Plan that says by the year 2030, this is a wish list. When it comes down to the Evan Development Plan, and I'm going to say Hobopili as an example, is this that this resolution merely would say, Ampo, talk to Evan Development Plan, get back to the legislative body, and tell us when are the roads going to get done. So it really does, it just puts a magnifying glass, Chair Fella. So if I can uh, make a motion, HCR 291. Looking forward to the board sending testimony in favor to the legislative body. A second. Any discussion? So the clarification on this is that we're just asking them to consider this uh, bill. Was it yes? Was that, was the, 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 the resolution actually would be Chair Ken Ito. I mean, we could focus on him, but I think that the Neighborhood Commission Office has a good template, right. which by would be to a whereas, and we take a, a motion, that the Neighborhood Commission Office could probably just, in my opinion, in this motion, just send it to all legislators. Okay. Send, send have a Neighborhood Board's decision tonight on this measure to all legislators. Okay. You said we're both of We have one more finished up. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Hey, Gary Bautista. Aye. Scott Aye. Sander. Aye. Beth Bella.
Eight to like half of it. So we can wrap it up. And the final one. Uh, in your packet, you see uh, House Bill 819. And Senator Sparrow alluded to this evening how this measure uh, and the Judiciary of the Senate Committee, at the final leg of its process of going through four committees, is they took out second degree. I would, I would like it if in House Bill 819 that this board not only supports the measure of which they by the same to direct all legislators to be in DC of our whereas, whereas. I have provided a whereas language for the Neighborhood Commission Office, Sheriff Fellow. So I'm looking at the board to take the handout in the packet on urging Hawaii State Legislature to pass of the whereas resolution that as it stands in the language before you, that that be advanced to all legislators. Ms. Atkins. All right. Uh, discussion, uh, discussion, uh, discussion. It's time for discussion. I'm sorry. Sorry. This is Karen's law. Yeah, the Karen's law, I have a question about that. First degree murder. Is it? Pertaining to um, like officers or or does it have? I mean, I'm I'm very confused about this. The, the, you want yeah, to? Yeah, you know, first degree murder says you planned it, you knew what you were doing, premeditated. you premeditated, you you just like in Karen's house who was murdered, the perpetrator of the convicted of the accused planned this, waited for her to come home. Yeah. And so it was premeditated. That's first degree. What they did in the Judiciary Committee is a second degree, which doesn't rise to that threshold of a level. And they remove second degree. So if someone just doesn't like you and wants to take you out <laughs> and just wants to murder you, but didn't pre plan such, but just didn't like the way you walk into 7 Eleven, they took that out of the bill. If you think about it, if you think about it, that removal of second degree murder has offended a lot of people. So I'm asking this resolution that what the resolution does, it restores yeah. second degree. Okay. Uh, question, Steve? Yeah. Go ahead. Not on that. It's on something else. Okay. Did you do it? Oh, I just want to say, this is probably one of the most partisan things that I've heard of in the last couple months, uh, devised by the Republican Party. Uh, in terms of taxation. I just want to let everybody know that it's a, it's a Republican-sponsored, generated, nationwide demonstration. And to call it nonpartisan is totally ridiculous. All right, can we have a vote on this bill? Can you say it again, Tom, please? To reintroduce the second degree for the Karens with his HC, what is this one? Was? HC or oh, HB eight nine? Eight one nine. nine. So, All right. Right. So the res the, the motion is is that the language before you with the handout that that be forwarded to all legislators. Okay. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Gary Bautista. Aye. Steve Nauer. Aye.